Hi, and welcome to the fourth episode of IMTV. That's the International Marxist Television Channel hosted by Socialist Appeal. My name's Adam Booth. I'm the editor of Socialist.net. And this week we're joined by Nico Baldian, who's the chair of the Kensington and Chelsea Momentum Group. And Kensington and Chelsea is obviously the borough where a year ago, almost exactly to the day, we saw the awful tragedy of the Grenfell disaster, which killed officially 72 people. And today we're going to be with Nico discussing the events that happened a year ago, the inquiry that's going on today, and the fight for justice for Grenfell. So, Nico, to start us off, can you tell us and remind us about the events that happened almost a year ago today? Why did this disaster, this tragedy occur? What were the, what were the factors that led to it happening? Yeah, sure, of course, Adam. Well, the actual fire started uh, just before 1 a.m. on the fourth floor due to a faulty fridge, uh, and it quickly spread to the outside of the building. The cladding, which had recently been installed, acted as a, as a chimney and burnt incredibly quickly. Uh, within the half an hour, the east side of the building had been engulfed in flames uh, by 2 a.m. Uh, the, the, the flames had engulfed most of the top floors of the building and, and, and spread round two, two thirds of the building. Um, now, there was several things that led up to this fire. There was the uh, complete lack of concern for health and safety by the TMO, the local council, uh, the residents raised concerns repeatedly, they were continuously ignored uh, and the the project was was done on the cheap without concern for these for these concerns. Uh, the cladding itself was something that's incredible is even produced. Uh, it's so dangerous. It had been banned uh, in furniture inside buildings since 1988, uh, but it was was put around the building in order to make it look presentable from the outside. Uh, but it had devastating consequences for the people who lived there. So, as you say, you had this disaster, this, this tragedy of the fire spreading very quickly and, and also what was very quick in the aftermath was the, the protests that we saw. Absolutely. Protests on the streets almost the day after, massive protests outside Kensington and Chelsea yeah. Town Hall. Lots of anger, particularly towards Theresa May, who I remember was very kind of robotic at the time, seemed very cold, very distant. What do you think was it that that really led to this kind of outburst of anger, this 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 massive uh, outpouring of of uh, kind of this mood of of disgust on the streets. You know, what where did that come from? Was it just about the fire? Were there bigger factors at play? Well, I think the the main the main reason it, it came about so explosively was because people were very much aware that they had been ignored all this time. Uh, they were very much aware that their community in North Kensington, in the Royal Borough of Kensington, they were aware of the, the value of the price uh, of the property around that area. And they knew that there had been a policy of managed decline. They knew they had been neglected because they had been living it for the past, you know, years, for the, for the past years, you know, there was a, a long history of campaign, of campaigning and, and working class struggle in that uh, area. Um, and so that was part of it. The other part of it was, of course, that at the time uh, where they knew a crime had been committed, the, the, no one was being arrested. There was, there was, you know, no one, uh, they, they had a list of people who they, who they knew ignored them, they had the contractors who, who put it up, they knew there was something wrong with the cladding, uh, and they were seeing, you know, the architects, uh, um, uh, Studio E, and, and all these other organisations just taking down the information about their involvement in the project to refurbish Grenfell. Uh, and when you see all this happening, of course people are going to be furious and mad, and they're furious also with Theresa May, with, with the bonfire of regulation, and there was also the complete lack of response from the local government, from the council. Uh, it was left up to the community. Uh, to and that's the a Tory-run council, isn't it? This is, a Tory run, this is a Tory-run council, uh, and it goes back a long time for 
the, the whole point of the TMO was to avoid culpability, it was arm's length management, uh, and the way it functioned where, you know, you'd have to give in a, if you had a complaint about something and you wanted to raise it at the AGM, you had to give in written notice six months in advance and it was up to the chair whether it would be heeded or not. It was a completely corrupt, in the pocket of the council organisation, uh, and it was what I could only describe as, as, a, as a war on the working class with this managed decline with the councillors who have links to property developers, aspiring uh, Rockfield Manning used to work for a property developing company. Uh, he was aspiring in this area, we believe. This is the deputy leader. This of was the, the Tory deputy council, leader of the, of the Tory council. In and charge so, of the redevelopment of, uh, of he, as well, he, I believe. He, he was in charge of housing. In ch he was in charge of housing, yeah. So this was immediately apparent to everyone. It wasn't a surprise, you know, but but the complete lack of response uh, and just the man going onto the radio as well, and he would he would say that residents never wanted sprinklers, hmm. when all this time you know we had residents who lived in that house who complained about the fire safety who were in the end vindicated by their death, uh, and had been had signed you know letters. Ninety percent of the residents had signed. And then this man says mm. that they don't want sprinklers. It's just absurd. So, so all of this led to the build-up of anger. And now, one year on, a lot of these revelations are coming out as part of the inquiry that's mm -hmm. in full swing. Uh, started recently, still ongoing, uh, and probably will be presumably ongoing for for some time. And there's lots of these kind of uh, these, like I say, these revelations, these scandals, kind of coming to light. What do you, as, as someone who's been involved in these campaigns and seen these campaigns as part of Kensington and Chelsea Momentum, what, what, what are the campaigns that are going on for justice? What are people demanding? What, do they, what would they like to see happening on the back of this inquiry and, uh, and the back of these campaigns? Right. Well, the, the, the main thing I think people want to see is people arrested and going to jail and those who are responsible are held to account. Uh, the, the justice campaign has had to fight, uh, this is like uh, Grenfell United uh, and, and Justice for Grenfell have had to fight in order to get the most basic uh, things like uh, extra panel members or widening the remit of the inquiry instead of just being purely how the fire started and spread. Uh, they wanted to wire the remit of the inquiry to cover some of these social issues which led to the start of the fire. And all of this they've had to fight for, even, even uh, you know, the, the promises that Theresa May made, May made at, about housing residents within three weeks. To even have people housed, they've had to fight and, and struggle to, to get these most basic demands uh, for. They've, they've done a good job and they campaigned. It wasn't just about uh, Grenfell, they also campaigned to have the cladding removed from all the other buildings, and this Theresa May has finally promised it. But uh, what's the progress been on that? The, the, uh, there still hasn't been any cladding removed from the government. Uh, uh, I think there's like been about three. I'm not sure. There's been about three that local authorities have, have removed the cladding themselves. Out of something like 300 buildings, uh, of, I think they identified three, nationwide that have got this dangerous cladding. 300 buildings, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and and now uh, finally she's made the promise to do it. Uh, we'll see. We'll see what becomes of that promise. Broken promises are a speciality <laughs> of Theresa May, you shouldn't forget. They, they are indeed. Uh, uh, but even her limited promise is going to come out of the affordable house building program, mm. um, which isn't, isn't correct. Bit of a slap in the face for people who've been campaigning Absolutely. over these things. Um, I mean, you've, you've brought up an important issue there, the question of affordable housing. Um, you're a resident of Kensington and Chelsea, one of the most unequal boroughs, you know, known often as you know, a playground for the rich, but also home to many council estates, working class neighbourhoods. Um, what, and you've also been involved, obviously, in, in, in campaigning on this issue um, about kind of social cleansing, gentrification, you know, the campaigns against uh, the de demolition of these housing estates. Can you explain a bit more about 
the kind of long-term trends that have been going on there? What have you seen as part of these campaigns around inequality, around gentrification? Mm. Yeah, well, um, just from my own experience, a, f a few years ago, I actually lived down in Chelsea, down on the opposite side of the borough. Uh, and it was a few year go years ago in 2014 uh, where the excuse was used of a crossrail station and the desire of the council was to, uh, they never said this openly, but you could tell by looking at a map, to put a crossrail station where our estate was. Uh, and we had seen the agents of Sloan Stanley and the aristocratic families that own most of Chelsea uh, surveying the, the property for its, its value and its wealth. Uh, just recently you've had the Sutton Estate also in Chelsea which was a housing association which is moving towards becoming purely a uh, property developer like any other. Uh, and it actually had the houses to rehouse all of the Grenfell uh, uh, survivors if it, if it wished to, uh, but they had purposefully destroyed uh, the bathrooms to make the houses uninhabitable. But the houses were there we have so many empty houses. You go is in some streets. There's one one in three houses are empty, and you can see it when you knock on their doors. You can see the the echo. And why are they empty? <laughs> uh, uh, they're empty because th there's not enough millionaires, <laughs> 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 or or the, the they're owned by someone who lives somewhere else. That put they're bought as investment mm. uh, to speculate on. Uh, they're run on a system for profit. It's not for need it's not for it's not to house people who are homeless it's not to house the people who need homes there's enough houses to today to rehouse everyone from from grenfell in luxury accommodation if if the political will was there to do it and this is what jeremy corbyn's obviously yeah. proposed and that was it? jeremy what jeremy corbyn proposed and it got such a backlash because it questioned the sacred right of private property which is obviously what capitalism is built on. Which is what capitalism is built on, but it's private property for the wealthy mm. and misery for the working class. But you touched on an important point earlier, which is that these councillors have actually got links to the property developers that are doing mm. this, this very social cleansing, this gentrification. They're the ones promoting mm. this investment, this parasitic kind of speculation. Um, That's right. We've got one in one in ten councillors in London have direct links with property developers. And obviously that's also shown up recently in Haringey when they've had the privatisation there of uh, the housing stock. And I believe the old council leader, even once she was kicked out, her first job has been within weeks to become part of a private property developer's yeah. firm as well. So it shows it's not just the uh, the rich Tories, it's also the right wing of the Labour Party. Absolutely, you know, there's, there's, when it comes to the, just the question of, of seeking justice, you know, there's, there's very specific circumstances which led to the fire at Grenfell. Uh, it didn't happen anywhere, it happened in Kensington and Chelsea because of all uh, the things that had built up to it, to this, to this culture of neglect, uh, uh, and also, you know, the cladding is in over 300 houses, it's, it's not just affecting us here, but it's, it, it's, they try to use to justify themselves. You see it now in the inquiry, everyone's trying to shift the blame to someone else and saying, oh, oh no, we've we done everything right, but so-and-so did this wrong. Mm. And, they're, and they're playing like a, a game of merry-go-round to, to try and shift the blame, when really they're all guilty. Mm. They all played their part and they should pay for it. And it's no excuse that there are hundreds of other criminals and crooks like them who put profit before, you know, the lives of people. Mm. And you talked about inquiries. Um, this isn't the first one, is it? Because there was also the Lacanal House in mm -hmm. Camberwell, 2009, I believe, where there was a fire. Yeah, and right. in that situation, you had an inquiry and they came up with a set of proposals to ensure that this would never happen again mm. and yet here we are mm. now in 2018 a year after the Grenfell fire 
A lot of people are saying that this won't be the last one either, that, that, that another Grenfell is just around the corner. Um, so what, what are the kind of demands that, that the justice campaigns, the justice for Grenfell campaigns, what are they saying? What do we need to, to happen, you know, not just in terms of putting people in prison, but on a wider scale mm. to ensure that this genuinely doesn't happen again? Well, they, they said we would need the cladding removed from the buildings. Uh, they, sp they speak of uh, tougher regulation and, and for it to be enforced. Uh, but in, in my personal opinion, I think that every time uh, you have regulation, it's, it's not enforced fully or in the, in, in, with the huge amount of public pressure and the huge amount of complaints that uh, residents are raising up and down the country, uh, you know, the cladding will have to go, the regulation will have to get uh, tougher, it would have to be enforced. But when, you know, the movement dies down and when uh, uh, the pressure of big business to cut red tape, to, to uh, get rid of so many things that get in the way of profit reasserts itself, there will be new dodgy materials, new uh, bodged, bodged work, new, uh, new instances where the regulation will no longer be followed or it will be weakened, it will be made more ambiguous, and then you'll have something else happen again. So what we have to do, in my opinion, is take power out of the hands of this you know, out of the hands of Ryden, out of the hands of Rock, the people like Rockfield Mallon, out of the hands of the, of, of, uh, the manufacturers, and put it into the hands of working class people to nationalise the banks, to nationalise the construction industry, to build homes, safe homes, affordable homes, uh, social homes, in order to actually deal with the problems we're facing up and down the country the housing crisis we're facing everywhere. Uh, and on that basis, on a socialist basis, we can actually make sure this won't happen again. I mean, one thing I, 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 I think, I, you know, I've got no direct uh, connection with it, but is the, the blacklisting of all the construction workers. All the time they raised health and safety, they would lose, they would, you know, not be able to find work in the future. Uh, all this history of working class people being ignored and being denied power has led to this culture where they could get away with, you know, putting huge gaps in between the, the window and the and uh, between the window frame that they got. They cut the size wrong and they and they filled it up with plastic. Uh, so if if working class people had the power to say, hold on, there's health and safety risks here, without fear of losing their job, maybe we wouldn't have seen it. There's so many what ifs that we wouldn't have seen it, but ultimately I think we need to have working class power to have control over our own lives. And that's what socialism is about. It's not just abstractly calling for fairness. It's about power and ownership. Thanks very much, Nico. And thanks to everyone joining us at home, uh, whether you're watching or listening. Uh, if you've enjoyed what Nico's had to say today, or you're interested in finding out more, the current issue of Socialist Appeal has a double page spread dedicated to the issue of the Grenfell tragedy and the anniversary of the fire and the inquiry that's currently taking place. If you'd like to find out more about other topics, check out our website, socialist.net, and tune in for the next episode when we're going to be discussing the student movement and the lessons from the recent UCU strikes. In the meantime, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes or on Stitcher and follow us on SoundCloud and YouTube for more episodes of IMTV. See you next time. Thank you.